Located in the heart of Joplin, Missouri, a small family-owned newspaper began as a humble source of hometown information. As the paper's readership grew over the years, it was transformed into a community cornerstone, embracing the virtues of change, justice, and unity for the citizens of Joplin. This is the story of the Joplin Uplift. For many years of Joplin's history, the local newspapers were published by and for white readers with little, if any, content for the city's black residents. In 1870, there were only 138 black residents in all of Jasper County. After Joplin's founding, three years later, more black people began to arrive seeking work. It was during this period that Pittsburgh, Kansas resident and attorney W.L. Yancey created the first known newspaper for black citizens, the Joplin Advance. Today, only one surviving copy of the Advance exists, preserved on microfilm at the State Historical Society. Dated to May of 1895, the paper is, in fact, the very first issue and opens with a salutation from Yancey. The message urges local businesses to support his newspaper. At the time, Yancey did not expect Joplin's white residents to subscribe, and thus he was dependent on not only black subscribers, but also black-owned businesses to generate revenue for his paper. Ultimately, the Joplin advance would not last very long, going out of print sometime before 1900. However, Yancey's efforts would lay the groundwork for a future black-owned newspaper in Joplin, one which would have a far greater impact on the local community. First printed in 1926, the Joplin Uplift took its name from the concurrent racial uplift movement. The movement was founded on the idea of empowering black Americans through education, communication, and involvement. It was a paper that was published here in Joplin by Augustus Tutt and his wife Fanny, and it was the only paper at the time published in Joplin for our local black community. Augustus Tutt first came to Joplin in 1912. He got his start working as a waiter at the Connor Hotel alongside another influential member of the black community in Joplin, Charles Cuther. Cuther and his wife Melissa briefly published their own newspaper, The Afro-American Leader, around 1917. Under Cuther's leadership, Tut served as the secretary of the Waiters Relief Fund Association. During the First World War, Tut traveled to Europe as a member of the 805th Pioneer Infantry, nicknamed the Bearcats. More than a century later, a surviving copy of Tut's unit yearbook was purchased by Nanda Nunley, president of the Mini Hackney Community Service Center and chair of the Unity and Diversity Committee for the Missouri Democratic Party. His name, Augustus G. Tutt. In his own handwriting, and it lists um, his name, his enlistment date of August 1st, 1918. He was 27 at that time. Um, it also asks his greatest experience, and he has written Hungary, the, com the country of Hungary, when he was in Hungary. And then his proudest moment, it says, when discharged, ha ha. <laughs> After returning home in 1919, Tut married Fanny Waite, a future school teacher at Lincoln Elementary. Their son, Garvin, was born in 1924, and their daughter, Evelyn, in 1926. Around the time of his second child's birth, Tut first conceived of the idea for the uplift. He and his wife then, in the late 20s, they started a newspaper here in town called the Joplin Uplift. Um, it, was, it was more than just a name. The uplift was, a, it was called the racial uplift movement that was kind of centered around the idea that the way to um, bring blacks at the time out of uh, some of the issues that they were having just being in, in our country was through education and 
but being involved in politics and those type of things. And his idea, I think, was the best way to do that was to through a newspaper. The people could find out what's happening in other parts of the country and also right here in our, in, in our local areas. Many readers felt connected to the local stories the Joplin uplift told. While the Tuts still included important national news, the uplift also gave its subscribers information about people close to them, friends, neighbors, and community members. Mr. Earl Frost has returned from a business trip in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Reverend E.A. Graham left Monday for California, Missouri to attend a district meeting at the M.E. Church. Mrs. H.S. Reedy has reported much improved after several weeks of illness. In this issue, a grieving wife has published an elegy for her departed husband. When we saw our darling drifting from this world of joy and woe, our hearts were filled with sorrow to think he had to go. We asked our Heavenly Father to hear our plea that we might keep him, but alas, it could not be. So, you know, imagine back then, I'm sure, just to have your name in the newspaper, and especially as a black or brown person, that was, that was big, you know. In one of the most recent, uh, one of the uh, editions that we were able to locate of the, the Uplift newspaper, um, Melissa Cuther is on the front page and it's talking about uh, her work with Ewart Park at that time. She was the park supervisor at that time. There, were, there was information about local things happening, but also information on a you know, much wider, greater level, like national politics and things like that as well. And it looks like some of the stories were probably written by uh, an organization that would share stories, kind of like how we see today from the AP. Oh, you have Los Angeles, Detroit, New Jersey. Then on the front, we have stuff that's more regional, Sedalia, but then there's New York. And then here we have, this is sort of the city briefs, the equivalent of the society section. Jill Halbach, director of the Post Art Library in Joplin, reviews some of the few surviving physical copies of the Joplin Uplift, on loan from local resident and longtime curator of Black History in Joplin, Betty Smith. So as far as the physical preservation of papers go, it is always difficult. The best way to preserve papers, uh, newspapers, is microfilm still. And there are copies of the Uplift preserved through the State Historical Society in Missouri. August 17th, 1928 is when this one came out. And at that time, the price of the paper was only five cents. <laughs> and it says up here in the corner, third year. It also says a newspaper without choice or favor. So often the idea behind some African-American papers were to try to better unite the white and black communities. The more that they could do to bring, to, to unify the communities, um, the better. The Joplin Uplift certainly succeeded in appealing to subscribers of all races. In this excerpt, the Tuts mentioned that their readership in Web City requires 150 papers every week, even though there were only three or four black families living there at the time. While the Tuts did strive to provide a platform for black residents with the Uplift, they also sought to provide pertinent and engrossing news for anyone who would read their paper. You've got all of these articles about, you know, uh, different things in the black community. And then here's this, this section talking about the birth of John Barrymore, the famous actor's daughter. And, um, but that was something that, you know, I'm sure John Barrymore was a very, very um, prominent actor at that time. And so of course, everyone would have been interested to know what, you know, the, about the birth of his daughter, so. Unfortunately, the unification ideals of the Joplin Uplift were not shared by society as a whole, even among the black community. 
In this December 1928 issue of the Joplin Globe, it's mentioned that Augustus Tut was attacked by a local man after asking him to subscribe to the uplift. The Tuts sought support through advertising from both white and black owned businesses. As you have a paper that's geared toward the local African-American community, but then you still need advertisers to advertise in the paper. And at the time that it was printed, people in our local black community couldn't go into a lot of places here because of segregation. Despite these challenges, the uplift proved to be very successful. In its lifetime, the newspaper appears in the city directories for five years, longer than any other local black newspapers in Joplin. The Tuts would later branch out to include other nearby communities. So it started out basically as the Joplin Uplift, and then he increased it to be Joplin Springfield. So they were able to then kind of loop in the, the Springfield um, community as well. The Uplift would ultimately go out of print in 1931, not long after the onset of the Great Depression. It's hard to run a newspaper if you don't have people advertising. It's hard to run a newspaper if you don't have subscribers. So um, all of those things had to come together for him to be able to keep that newspaper going. Even after the end of the uplift, Tut continued to play an active role for the Joplin community. His, his home is also listed in um, the Green Book as a, as a home for people to be able to stay uh, black people, when they were traveling at that time, couldn't stay in hotels, so his home is also listed there. The Green Book served as a travel guide for black Americans, describing welcoming and non-discriminating homes during the times of segregation. Tragically, Augustus Tut would pass away from heart disease in 1933, less than a week before his 42nd birthday. More than 90 years later, he rests peacefully at Fairview Cemetery on Maiden Lane. Though Mr. Tut may be gone, his family legacy still endures. Fanny Tut went on, she married a man later after Augustus passed away, she married a man by the name of Walter Eccles. So she became Fanny Eccles. And Miss Fanny Eccles, um, she was one of the founders of the Negro Service Council, which is now the Minnie Hackney Community Service Center. Um, she also taught at Lincoln School. For many years, the Lincoln School was a designated facility for black students during the period of segregation. It was also often utilized as a community center for black residents. Eccles would also serve as a Sunday school superintendent for Joplin's handy AME chapel seen here on downtown 4th Street. Fanny's son, his name was Garvin Augustus Tut. They kind of switched it around, A-G to G-A. Um, G-A Tut, he went on to become a very, very decorated um, uh, colonel and then moved to California and had um, two daughters, Barbara and uh, another daughter. and. Um, Barbara, of course, serves us now as a United States Congresswoman from California. When I had the chance to meet uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, uh, when I told her that I was from Joplin, the first thing she said was, my grandmother lived at 901 Missouri Street. <laughs> and I just thought it was so funny. She remembered that. She remembered the address of her grandmother's house because they would come here to, to visit. In 2022, Nunley led a drive to create a mural dedicated to black history and performing arts. Painted by artist Alexander Austin and located in downtown Joplin, the mural features famous performers who visited Joplin during the height of their careers. Among those pictured are the Joplin-born Langston Hughes, Scott Joplin, and the legendary Duke Ellington. Nunley played an important role in including the Uplift's name in the artwork. I wanted us to say the name. You know, um, for so many years, people had no idea about it. Um, just like seeing those faces up there, people didn't know that Sammy Davis Jr. performed in Joplin. People didn't know that Ella Fitzgerald performed in Joplin. But people didn't know that that there was a newspaper called the Joplin Uplift that served our community and the Springfield community for you know quite a few years. 
And to me, that was the most important thing, that people know, that people say it. As we remember and celebrate the history and legacy of the Joplin Uplift, Nunley encourages everyone to follow in the Tut's footsteps. He put his mind to it and he wanted to serve his community in that way. So I think the most important thing that we can learn from Augustus Tut is that, um, you know, you find a need in the community, you fill it. He felt like that was his calling and, um, and I'm just so, so very thankful.